Okay, so most people in the room understand that scalability is a major roadblock to broader adoption of blockchains. Uh, but scalability tends to be a highly technical topic that's really hard uh, for people that aren't deep in it to, to grasp. So on this panel, we've got uh, three of the best technical minds in the world that are working on scalability solutions. And the goal of this panel is to you know, talk about these topics in a relatable way um, for a semi-technical audience. So we're going to talk about the technicals but not go too deep in it and try to keep it fairly high level. So I want to start by you guys kind of talking about why scalability is uh, important to you and why it's kind of a, a problem that you decided to spend time on. And maybe we could start with Joseph, since your work on scalability has spanned many years and many different projects dating back to Lightning and Bitcoin and now Plasma on top of Ethereum. Yeah. Um, so as a quick background, I'm known for um, being one of the authors of the Lightning Network. Um, on Bitcoin, which is, deals with a lot of payment scalability. Um, I've done work on, you know, um, block size, extension blocks, um, as well as currently a lot of effort when it comes to smart contract scalability with regards to Plasma. And uh, there's a lot of people thinking about um, smart contract scalability. Jason's doing really awesome stuff with Truebit, and uh, Jaquan's doing really, really interesting stuff with uh, Cosmos. And um, what Plasma does is deals with, allows you to do uh, smart contracts um, to enable you to do blockchains inside blockchains and the enforceability um, to allow the blockchain to um, scale potentially to, you know, billions of transactions per second to be able to build this like true world computer. Um, and scalability is an interesting problem to think about because it allows us to really you know, like if this stuff needs to take over the world, like really, like in terms of like be able to make measurable impact, um, the demand for this type of thing will be incredibly intense because what we're doing is for, we're financializing a lot of transactions, and that could the applications for that is like really really profound. Maybe just talk quickly about um, why I don't know if there was some major catalyst that uh, made you kind of switch from focusing on Bitcoin scalability to to focusing on Ethereum. Scalability. Well, I am putting focus on everything. Um, okay. I, I, I spoke at DevCon and scaling Bitcoin, so it's sort of you know wearing hats with everything, and it allows um, a more like holistic perspective. I think you know um, that's also why I think people like Andrew Miller is able to do a lot of interesting work because it's like taking different perspectives and like bridging that gap. Um, for example, like Plasma takes a lot of presumptions about the UTXO model. Um, of Bitcoin, whereby, and the UTXO model is a very specific model for designing um, payments and, and, and how to structure the blockchain. And it's building that on top of Ethereum. So it's sort of like Ethereum has an accounts model at its base, and then you have a UTXO model on top of that. And that you can only do that combination if you have a functional account model at its base. So it's sort of like taking the best of both worlds into Ethereum kind of thing. Jason, maybe you can talk a little bit about Truebit and um, maybe juxtaposed to Plasma how it works at a high level, and also kind of why you decided to, to focus on that. Yeah, Matt, thanks. Joseph and Jay, both doing very interesting work at scalability here. Truebit is a little different from Plasma in that we're doing something which we call interactive verification. So they're both the same in the sense that you push the main work, whatever that is, off of the main chain, whatever that is. Um, but for us, the focus is purely, it's not on transaction throughput, but rather computational bandwidth. So right now, if you run a smart contract in Ethereum, it's going to run for some tiny fraction of a second. And we'd like to see them more like a desktop computer. So the, the, uh, the idea is to, <clears throat> I mean, imagine Ethereum without a gas limit, basically. But, and then we also have, as a side effect, I don't know if it's really a side effect of the construction, but you could also use in those computations data that's not on the chain, as long as you can guarantee that it's not going to disappear while you're computing with it. So we're, those are the sort of two technical reaches of this project in contrast with Plasma, and I, I guess. Uh, so maybe relatable for people in this room, uh, an application that's blown up in the past week, which has already been mentioned several times, is CryptoKitties, right? And CryptoKitties is already congesting the Ethereum network or, or close to it, right? So could maybe in the context of that, could Truebit 
solve something like that? Yeah, I guess it depends what you mean by solve. I'd love to see those crypto kitties sitting on a real computation engine instead of having pictures of cats, you should actually have real cats on the network. I mean, that's, that's where I think we're really headed with this. But on top of that, one thing people don't always know about Truebit is that it also can be a scalability solution for transactions. If you're, so right now, Truebit is a retrofitting solution on top of Ethereum. If you're willing to start with, from scratch with the new blockchain, remember there are two things that miners do. They choose the transactions and they also verify them. So one thing you could do is just say, well, let the miners choose the transactions and let Truebit verify them. Uh, so you decouple these two things and now a, a transaction clears when Truebit says, yeah, it's, it's, it's been verified. So that is a way that you could sort of scale computations as well. So in, in that's, we're not, uh, you can view um, Truebit as a sort of throughput solution as well in that sense. Cool. So Jay, maybe you want to talk a little bit about um, kind of maybe your historical context in terms of thinking about scalability dating back to, you know, Tendermint and now what you're focused on on Cosmos. Thanks. Um, right. I'm Jay. Um, I'm working on proof of stake and consensus algorithms in the blockchain space since 2014. And, um, and I wasn't really interested in scalability for the longest time because I was so focused on proof of stake. Right. And then uh, it turns out that uh, if you have a good proof-of-stake system, then you can solve scalability uh, in a limited form by, uh, by having many chains that can directly communicate with each other. And the reason why proof-of-stake helps here is because um, in proof-of-work land, like, uh, like client SPV, if you've heard of that, uh, requires you know, uh, waiting for confirmations on the proof-of-work chain uh, for like six confirmations or you know, however much proof-of-work you want. But in, in a BFT context, in, in Tendermint's proof of stake, uh, all you need are uh, signatures uh, from a supermajority of the validators of that blockchain. So you can get proof uh, that you know, the last block was committed to finality uh, instantly. So every block is instant uh, and final. And, and I was just obsessed with like this uh, uh, particular notion of like getting finality as quickly as possible and making that proof as short as possible because I wanted good mobile-like client security. And it turns out um, that system can be used to scale uh, uh, the blockchains, right? So what you do is you have uh, a blockchain that is shared uh, at the center among many other blockchains. Uh, and so all of these blockchains connect to this common blockchain and uh, the common blockchain is the one that you know, it's acting as a custodian, uh, keeping track of all the blockchains that are connected to it and how many tokens they have, right? Uh, acting as like the DTCC would for securities in the US as a central clearing bank, uh, a central bank would in any other uh, banking system. Uh, and this allows you to achieve a kind of scalability where you can have many independent blockchains running in parallel and yet have uh, over, uh, overall global security that you're not going to get some crazy systemic double spend risk because as long as that hub, that common custodian is secure, everyone uh, is secure. So uh, we, we took this concept and uh, had a fundraiser in April. It's called Cosmos. Uh, so Cosmos can, can be summed up as a, uh, a network of interoperating uh, Tendermint-like BFT chains. And uh, our mission is to create the scaling solution, the immediate scaling solution needs of the cryptocurrency economy and, and, and its uh, ecosystem, uh, particularly in, uh, for tokens, right? So we're not so interested in, uh, we're not trying to solve a general purpose scaling solution for smart contracts or anything like that. We just want to make sure that uh, uh, we can, we have the infrastructure and the protocols necessary and a common hub uh, that can uh, keep track of tokens across many sovereign uh, and non-sovereign blockchains like. So it seems like um, kind of Joseph and Jason, what you guys are focused on is really on top of Ethereum in terms of Plasma and Truebit, whereas Cosmos is taking a more kind of horizontal approach where you may see a world of many different chains um, and that's how kind of, you know, scalability gets solved. So I don't, how, what are the pros and cons of each approach, I guess? Like why, Joseph, do you think that, um, you know, Ethereum 
may be the main chain and it's worth extending out on top versus a more horizontal approach? Well, I think, you know, the, the types of things we're talking about here today, the, the main value that we're talking about is that there's a, lot of, there's a lot of smart contracts that people are writing today that don't really like scale, like we were talking about like the demands that CryptoKitty is, it has been putting on the Ethereum chain. And solving these problems are fairly effective for perhaps like any future blockchain. Right? It's, it's a way of the, the design and architecture and models and mechanisms that we're designing can be applied pretty much everywhere. And I think a lot of people are taking these types of designs and applying it to their own chains. That said, um, it's primarily about the community, right? Like when people talk about, you know, how to do token investing and stuff like that, what is their strategy? Oh, the, the, the principal thing that I'm noticing is the community matters first. Right? You can design a great technology, you can design a great, a great business plan, a great platform, whatever it may be, but if you don't have the foundational aspect of this community behind you, everything falls flat. And being in this space for six plus years, like that's just what I've been noticing over and over and over again. So it's less so about choosing an individual platform than you are choosing a community. And the Ethereum community is fairly effective when it comes to doing a lot of forefront work, when it comes to designing new mechanisms and new uh, crypto economic models. And that's why this is being done within the context of the Ethereum community. Um, that said, that the, the, these types of technologies are applicable everywhere. And I think a lot of people on different projects are also implementing Plasma related things with them. But I think that's sort of why you see that as the particular forefront, the Ethereum community in particular. That makes sense. Jason, do you have anything to add on that, on like why Ethereum? Mm, why not Ethereum? No, <laughs> I, I mean, Trubit isn't necessarily a Ethereum project. Trubit is a retrofitting solution that can be put on top of Ethereum. It takes advantage of the smart contracts, but it can certainly work on other platforms as well, and I sort of see that that's sort of integral as Joseph was talking about communities, on-chain communities, but also off-chain communities. I mean, one of the original inspirations for the Trubit protocol was to the, the, the Doge Ethereum bridge, which was supposed to be a, a bridge between Dogecoin blockchain and, and Ethereum blockchain. So we're interested in community from, from our very roots and we're actually building the software for the Doge Ethereum. In fact, we're building a community around the bridge as well. In, the, in real life, we're running the first open source art project. We're physically building the Doge Ethereum bridge. And um, everyone who is going to be in San Francisco next week, I welcome to come for uh, TBA, come see. <laughs> The, 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 oh, the, where's the bridge? Not, you don't want to know where the meetup is. So that's, the, so that's one thing we have to discuss in the meeting next week. But we'll, uh, it's, it's, then, then we're going to have in, in Jan, January, we'll, we'll have a, um, an art hackathon. And that's what we're going to use to actually launch the bridge. But we have now a structure. Our, our, the reason we're having next week, our art director is coming from New York. Let's get back onto scalability. Um, oh, yeah. I think the, the, uh, the bridge is interesting. And part of this, I think you, you, you told me, is that, uh, the bridge idea is really to reinvigorate the Dogecoin community as well in the spirit of the community. And you, you also need them to change some code effectively to make this bridge work. Is that right? Absolutely right. And we have to tap the Doge community. Number one, because they're an awesome community. This is the, these are the people that send the Jamaican bobsled team to the Olympics in 2014. And uh, they, it is true that in order to make the bridge activate the bridge, we have to convince the miners to install the software. You know, there hasn't been a change on the, the Dogecoin GitHub repo in the last two years, so we have to get their attention, and we have to, and, and it's actually more interesting than that, because now the Doge is merged mine with, with Litecoin, we're actually appealing to the Litecoin miners, but if there's no install, there's no bridge, so. Is there anyone from the Dogecoin community in here? Okay, <laughs> cool. <laughs> okay, so I guess moving on. So Jay, I know you guys, while you are taking a horizontal approach, you are very pro Ethereum as well, and you're also working on something called Ethermint, which is essentially a hard spoon, if you will, um, on top of the Cosmos Hub. So why don't you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. Um, so Ethermint is uh, it's the name of a project. Uh, it's Go Ethereum, which is the Golang implementation of Ethereum, mashed up with Tendermint, so you can use uh, our BFT algorithm 
Uh, and if you want to make it a private Ethereum chain, you can run Ethermint. Uh, and pretty soon, uh, as soon as we integrate the Cosmos SDK into it, uh, we'll also have that be a proof of stake system too. So if you want, you can even launch your own proof of stake Ethereum uh, Ethermint chain. But um, yeah, and to your point, uh, we're very close with the Ethereum community, uh, and we want to support that ecosystem. And frankly, I just want to see CryptoKitties succeed. You know, I want that stuff to be really trading and scaling on Ethereum. Uh, it goes to show how important Ethereum is because the fact that you know, it's a Turing complete smart contract language means you know, that's where a lot of the innovation in crypto economics is happening today. So I think it's very important to support Ethereum. Um, and we'll do that by um, giving everyone who has Ether some photons. So that's what we mean by the hard spoon. Uh, it's kind of like a hard fork. Uh, we're going to copy the Ethereum distribution, uh, and, and it'll be the Ethermint chain. Uh, and those tokens will be called photons. We're not trying to compete with Ethereum. We're just trying to give the community access to our system. And besides, we need a native uh, fee token in Cosmos anyway. So this is a great way to introduce a fee token to many people. Um, and uh, yeah, so you'll be able to mm, pay for transaction fees, uh, create smart contracts on any of our Ethermint zones connected to the Cosmos Hub, and, uh, and, and play. And, uh, and after that, when we've shown how you can have multiple Ether Ethermint uh, zones running in parallel, of course, this is not smart contract calls across shards, right? It, the Hub only helps here as long as you can shard by uh, moving tokens from one chain to another and having these, otherwise having these zones, these blockchains can uh, be, be isolated in logic and state, right? And the hub is keeping track of that just one, uh, just a few things, right? Just a few state data about every single blockchain connected to it. So it's a limited form of scaling, but we will demonstrate it on Ethereum. And then uh, as soon as we do that, we'll connect to uh, Ethereum and bridge to Ethereum proper as well. Um, and uh, yeah. And a developer might want to use Ethermint basically because it, it's the same programming language. They can port their code over to Ethermint and get a thousand transaction per second scalability versus seven or roughly. Is that? Yeah, uh, we've, we've, we've demonstrated hundreds of transactions per second on Ethermint. I, I wouldn't push it that far yet. I'd go, for, uh, you know, maybe a hundred, but you also have to consider syncing as well. So a hundred transactions per second or maybe less is is what, uh, how much vertical scalability can get by running Ethermint. And you have to also, the other thing that's nice is you get instant finality. So you don't have to wait for like transaction uh, blocks, you know, to, to confirm, but you get proof that, hey, this transaction just went in, you know, and you can, you can prove the Merkle proof into the state and all that. And it uses the same RPCs because it's Go Ethereum, so it's Web3 compatible. Uh, yeah. So if, you, if you've been developing in Solidity, great. Cosmos will support that. Uh, uh, we will have Ethermint zones running on Cosmos. Cool. So maybe we could talk a little more about applications. Uh, CryptoKitties is obviously one application that needs scalability, right? But what are some of the other interesting ones? Maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, some, some of them that you're interested in on top of Plasma. Yeah, so when it comes to um, tokens on top of Plasma, I think like, um, you know, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, to Plasma itself doesn't really have a native token in itself. It's a library, it's a framework they can use to achieve scalability. Um, but what I think will end up happening is a lot of token projects may end up using Plasma simply because it, it not only achieves scalability, but gives a certain viability when it comes to pr practical token models. Um, so in effect, if you wanted to launch a token on top of Plasma, the presumption is that it's a proof of stake model. Um, and this is the model that you know, um, Omise Go is using, for example, um, whereby the transaction fees achieved on this network pay into the token owners. And, in order to re it, and this gives you a certain measure of scalability. Um, what's interesting in this space is I think people are becoming much more sophisticated uh, this time around. Um, compared to uh, the last token summit, um, there were a lot of you know unviable token models, and I think we've been seeing a lot of that. And I think the common consensus is that like a lot of these token models just don't work. It's not even it's not even controversial to say that like it's it's considered relatively passe, right? Um, so what what Plasma gives a lot of these token models is that you need to reach scalability, you need to reach a certain measure of scale. Plasma needs perhaps a native token if you're doing smart contract activity. And as a result, you, you issue a token so that it 
enables you to have this proof of stake mechanism inside Plasma itself. You collect transaction fees, and that could be a viable model long term for the Ethereum ecosystem. Of course, there's multiple other efforts and projects and solutions, but this could be one path that token models take. And I've heard you talk before about uh, private chains as well, potentially using Plasma, right? This idea of a computational court, if you will, where yeah. uh, you know a, a private bank chain that wants to settle on the Ethereum blockchain might do that, right? Is that? Yeah. So um, what's fun is that um, you know private consortium chains mostly don't work, right? It's mostly role playing right now, and anyone building one right now probably doesn't know what they're doing. Um, it, like there's not much innovation in reality happening. They're putting out a lot of PR, but the real innovation is happening in the open space Ethereum community, for example. Um, and what could be interesting is that if you have multiple private entities wanting to coordinate in some way, um, it's, 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 it's a bit silly to do that if there's no enforceability mechanism, right? The enforceability mechanism right now for private chains is you go to like legal court. And that's not that effective. That's basically what we have right now. It's a little bit of a waste of time. You can't really treat it, you know, you don't have social finality, if you will, right? <laughs> um, so as a result, what you could do is build a private chain on top of a public chain. And I think that's going to be an emerging narrative starting next year um, or the year after when it comes to private chains, whereby you essentially, you know, assume there's three parties, N parties, where there'd be like 10 parties in, so, in some consortium. and if any of these parties decide to cheat in some way, you can go to the public chain, you know, you go to Ethereum and you say, oh, I'm going to enforce this invalid activity. And that way you have assurance that these nine other parties, if you're one of these parties, that they're not going to abuse the system, that the enforceability is programmatic into a public system where, uh, while also maintaining this private network that you control. Is anyone involved in private chains grasping to this concept yet? Or is this still something that you just... Yeah, I mean, in private, everyone running a private chain knows it's like insane like BS, right? Um, I mean, they might not tell that to their clients or their customers or whatever it is. Um, but, you know, they're probably going to adopt these types of systems because that's the only way to make this kind of stuff work. Jason, maybe you could talk a little bit about some ap applications you're excited about on using Truebit. Yeah, I think it's... It's all about big data. If you don't have a place to do computation and you don't have a place to, do, to, to store data, you don't really have a computer yet. So that's what would the things that we're used to looking at. Like so, so for example, LivePeer is a decentralized live streaming video platform, which you need, if you're doing live streaming video, you need a lot of computational bandwidth to do the transcoding to get all the different codecs into your different devices. And um, uh, if you, it's, it's a computationally intense uh, process to take a raw broadcast and convert it. So if you want to do this in a decentralized way, you need a machine that's capable of reading in the data and also processing it. So I think this is a really great application. So you think just like decentralized YouTube, I guess you can think. But live streaming, of course, that really what puts it to the test. And then also I think the, the idea of going into doing data markets, um, projects like Numeri and OpenMind and Ocean Protocol, these are... Um, really interesting ways of, you know, basically you think about having a data stream coming in and a data model coming in, and you have some criteria for whether that data model is doing good to, well, on predicting the data, like if you're a numeri, it can predict the stock market, and then this machine in the middle can, which maybe that's, it's a true bit, can, can now pay out the remuneration fairly based on how successful the model is. So, I mean, you could get feed in like the Netflix problem or, or whatever, I mean, there's, this is, it's about it's all about data, so that's 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 what I'd say. Got it. Mm -hmm. And Jay, how about you? And anything beyond? Obviously, Ethermint is kind of a near-term focus. Any kind of longer-term applications that you think are interesting for Cosmos? Um, I think there. Are, yeah, we just want to support as many applications as there are. But you know, I would just say, for the short and medium term, long term, who knows what's going to happen? Cosmos will have its own life. But uh, all like. All I care about is uh, creating a, 
uh, ensuring that we have a viable, scalable, secure alternative to the fiat monopoly system so that we can you know, have a more uh, robust and uh, decentralized uh, economy. Uh, and everything's geared towards that, so, yeah. Um, uh, and to that point, to make it secure, I feel like one of the major things that we haven't quite figured out yet, but next year is going to be a huge year for, is, is, is how to solve, uh, how to create exchanges, you know, scalable, decentralized, secure exchanges with good liquidity so that everyone can use uh, uh, exchange tokens freely, right? And uh, I'm not going to say that Cosmos, we're not trying to create the DEX solution, right? But we're tr with the Cosmos Hub, we're trying to create uh, the platform for experimentation of distributed exchange ideas. So I'm looking forward to uh, distributed exchanges and just a more secure and scalable token economy. So some, some people cite a lack of funding as a potential bottleneck, or, or not necessarily funding, but kind of developers as a potential bottleneck for uh, you know faster scalability solutions. So, how do you guys think about that? Maybe talk a little bit about how you guys are funded to date, and and how big are your teams, and how are you thinking about growing and things like that. Yeah, um, on my end, um, you know, I'm I'm trying to replicate a lot of what happened with Lightning. So, with Lightning, what happened was um, there were multiple teams working on it independently and sort of creating a forum. And right now, today with Lightning, there's um, you know four implementations, and they're all building cross compatibility right now. And it's very much a process of you know explore the problem space, build it up, and then develop it as is. Um, I'm an advisor for one of the projects implementing it, um, and we say go. Um, but I you know need a certain sense of neutrality with that, um, similar to what happened with Lightning, whereby you know there there are multiple teams implementing it. All collaborating, all taking leadership, you know, among equals kind of thing, and I think that's what's going to happen when it comes to funding um, of these projects. It's the independent projects funding them. Um, you know, I'm I'm just doing this as a facilitator and to help things out. Um, that's no ICO. Um, it, there's no ICO for Plasma inherently. It's it's mostly projects that need it for their platforms. So there could be projects that have launched ICOs independently, internally funding development. And then, and then submitting it to like public open source efforts as well. Um, that's the context that I feel like is relatively sustainable in this context. Um, you know, like, it, like, like you sort of alluded to earlier, the primary constraint is not money in this space. The primary constraint is developer talent, and that's, I mean, like all the all the really sharp token funds have already figured that out, right? They just go straight to like, okay, who are the developers? Who's working on this? What are the relevant people working on this? Um, what are the designs? What are you know, like they, that that they, that's sort of the minimum bar and criteria for this space, simply because it's so hard to find people. We're talking about measured on the probably hundreds of people working in this space, right? Everyone is way way stretched thin. This is like a big, big problem right now. It takes about two years to spin up in the space, even if you have deep experience in, in like systems design, right? The fastest I've seen is two years to get up to the forefront. And this problem is severely exacerbated by the amount of demand for you know, use cases, the, amount, the demand for talent and stuff like that. And scalability is really, scalability and interchain interoperability is sort of the forefront in terms of these problem spaces. Um, proof of stake is another topic, you know, and um, uh, in new consensus mechanisms around that. Um, and there's just not that many people working on it is the constraint right now. So how many developers are working on Plasma right now? Um, I think there's about four or five teams interested in spinning things up. Um, need to start some type of like bi-weekly call and forum. Um, I'm sort of dropping the ball on that. I need to do that sooner rather than later. Okay. And Jason, maybe you want to talk a little bit about TrueBit and, and funding and, and team and things like that. Yeah, sure. TrueBit's an open source software project. We get a lot of help from our open source community, but we also have a, a core team that sort of really moves things along. And I'm very happy to say that you can now run a verification game on the Rospin testnet. So that's like been a huge uh, uh, accomplishment, I guess, especially uh, led by Sammy Michaela, who engineered the architecture for the off-chain uh, 
piece, the, which is based on WebAssembly technology. Um, uh, so we're keeping this tech light, but um, there's it's, it's, it's a great tool. It's out there. Everyone can, anyone can load, download Docker, try it out. Um, but we've we've seen, yeah. I mean, it's it's true. Developers is a talent is a, is a scarce resource in this space. But we've we've also seen that if you bring like really exciting projects, people people come and do it. Like uh, there was a paper that Vitalik and I put out. Um, uh, well, now Christopher Brown now together have joined as a co-author on called interactive coin offerings. And we said, you know, we were like, we don't have the resources to to, to really. I'm like, I'm like, I, I looked at, it, I just said, how are we gonna, how are we gonna do it? You know, so we we just we basically threw it out there, and people came up and they said, you know, we, we want to build it, we want to use it, we want we want to get involved. And I think this is this has been like our the way that we've been able to grow our team by getting momentum behind ideas that we're really passionate about and find other people who are really excited about them too. And Jay, maybe just quickly on, on Cosmos and how you guys are funded and, and size of team and things like that. Yeah, okay. Um, we had our fundraiser in, uh, in, in April and uh, raised uh, like $17 million worth uh, in Bitcoin and Ether. Uh, and we had to shut it down because uh, we had a cat and we didn't want to raise too much. And I'm really, really glad that we did that because uh, uh, our holdings have gone up. You know, the price of uh, those coins have appreciated significantly. And like we can just focus on, you know, delivering the product, not worrying about the valuation of, our, of, 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 uh, of atoms or anything like that. Just focus on the code. So it's been uh, very good for us. And I would say to anyone who thinks that they need a lot of money, like over, you know, anything over even like 10, I'd say, uh, it, you don't need that money, right? Like, it, it's just a liability for you. Uh, it's, it's crazy to think that, like, there's nothing yet. Like, in order to build a good product, you have to have a good team. And to build a good team, you kind of have to, like, scale that team organically. Right, so what are you going to do with all that capital? It's just going to, you know, uh, distract you and become a liability for you. Um, we're 25, 28 people. Uh, we've got major hubs. So we've got a hub in uh, the Bay Area. We just opened a Berkeley office, and uh, we've got Toronto and Berlin. Uh, and the full node office in Berlin is, uh, yeah, <laughs> full node. Uh, and uh, hopefully, we'll have more full nodes, and we can all connect them together into a huge blockchain uh, space hub. See you in Berlin. Yeah, see you in Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the reasons I'm personally optimistic about Ethereum scalability in particular is, you know, scalability is not a new problem in blockchains, right? Dating back five years, this has been something people in Bitcoin have been thinking about, right? And in the, the days of Bitcoin, I think there were maybe one or two projects working on this, but it, it seems like there's just a, a, a kind of a mass collection of projects like you guys that are kind of collectively working on these problems, right? In addition to, uh, you know, the, at the protocol layer, uh, what, uh, you know, Casper is doing with sharding. Maybe you guys could quickly share your perspective on, on sharding in particular as a kind of on-chain way to scale uh, Ethereum. Yeah, I think there needs to be many different approaches. We need to take many different perspectives. Um, it's, it's basically a critical blocker in this ecosystem and is going to shape basically every single one of these token projects. Like if you want to look at, you know, really understanding how this ecosystem is going to be playing out one year out, two year out, making the correct strategy and making the right moves, you need to be looking at what the technical people are doing because it's just basically going to reshape what every single token white paper is probably going to do in the next two years. And sharding is definitely a component of that. Yep. Any any extra uh, color on on thoughts on sharding, and way, when that may come to fruition, perhaps? I mean, what I guess what, what do you mean sharding? Like what we're doing is a kind of sharding. I I mean or Ethereum. I mean Ethereum. Ethereum. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sharding. So yeah. that means no Zilliqa sharding. I mean, that, yeah. That, well, that, I guess that's that's if there's a sharding platform, it's it's that's probably the one right now. But it's it's the. Uh, of course, it, it couldn't be done on Ethereum because they had to change the underlying consensus protocol, which is roughly based on Elastico. But in, yeah, it's a good way to get transaction throughput. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Any last thoughts on you know what you're excited about um, in the next 12 to 18 months? Uh, launching the Cosmos Hub. Yeah, feels yeah. It's been a long time in the making. Can't wait. I'm excited about our art project. I'm excited about AI, the um, art DAO. I think Crypto Kitties is sort of first example of that. I'm, I'm excited to make as many like experimentations in the next six months as quickly as possible. I think we need to be doing like the, everyone in this space, everyone in this room should really be pushing like the pedal to the metal on experimentation right now. Like you look at cryptocurrencies, like the total market cap, we're talking about like what, $300 billion, right? Like next year, if it gets even crazier, like everyone behind the scenes right now is like freaking out that this is like, oh, this is starting to be real money now. Like, like it has like real effects. Right now, like, you know, if the experimentations are still like, you know, we're, it's still expensive, but like we need to make these experiments right now. Like when it comes to like allocating capital into projects, like just, you know, find good technical teams and just run experiments because like these experiments are about to get really expensive really soon in, in terms of social impact. Just a quick plug. Uh, we'll be launching uh, the Cosmos SDK pretty soon, so go to cosmos.network and just subscribe to our mailing list and we'll have you. Uh, we're baking currently an, in the oven a, uh, an SDK framework for you to develop any blockchain application, uh, primarily in Go. Uh, so if you don't want to write something in Solidity, but you want to write something natively in Golang that's fast, uh, then check out our SDK. That's, that's what our hub is based off of. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks.